and uh, hand things over to um, group 663U, the ShakeCore group. Hello, and welcome to our final presentation of our microbioreactor shaker table. We are group 663U, ShakeCore, and we consist of Emily Briscoe, Olivia Clubley, Austin Horrell, Trevor Noyes, Natasha Polito, Spencer Schmidt, and Brett Winter. So first we'll start out with the product specifications, things like the overall dimensions, the movement system and its capabilities. Then we'll go through the major testing deliverables, going over the key results of the linear orbital and double orbital testing. And then we'll show a short video of that testing being conducted. Then we'll move on to the design highlights and key features, starting with the Core XY movement system itself. And then we'll move on to the well support plates and then to our design choices for the Core XY actuation mechanism. And then we'll go over the evolution of the system, going through the concept design, then moving to <clears throat> the CAD modeling, and then finally to the prototyping phase. We'll highlight the major changes made along the way and the reasoning behind those changes. And then finally, we'll go over some logistical metrics like cost, assembly time, and the overall cost of production. All right, so we'll begin by examining some of the key product specifications associated with our design. Firstly, the overall footprint of the design is 10 inches wide by 12 inches long by 6.3 inches tall. Um, this makes the Shakehor prototype smaller than many other designs, with the option to shrink the prototype even more in future iterations. Um, secondly, the Shakehor design utilizes 4XY actuation. This method is often used to orient the print head in modern 3D printers. To accomplish this motion, it uses two high torque NEMA 17 stepper motors coupled with two TMC 2280 drivers that power those stepper motors and provide quiet actuation. The design gets its power from a 120 volt 10 amp power supply and a smaller 12 volt USB power supply. The larger 10 amp power supply is used to power the stepper motors and the stepper drivers, while the smaller power supply is used to power the Arduino, which gives the prototype its logic. Finally, the design successfully shakes in linear orbital and double orbital shaking patterns, each of which are fully adjustable anytime thanks to individual dial control. Moving on, after the completion of the prototype, each shaking pattern was tested individually in a torture test. Uh, the goal of this test was to shake above 350 RPM for preset increments of time established by the teaching team. Success was based on the design reaching the full time limit without suffering a failure of any type. During the linear endurance test, the shake core prototype operated at a speed of 600 RPM or exceeding the 55 minute time limit without any failures of any sort. For the orbital endurance test, the prototype operated at a speed of 418 RPM for over two hours. No failures were recorded during this testing session either. Finally, the Shakehor prototype completed the double orbital endurance test at a speed of 700 RPM. The design exceeded the 55 minute time limit with no recordable failures. Drawing your attention to the fine print on the slide, the Shakehor design capable of speeds greater than 1000 RPM for each shaking pattern. However, um, the endurance tests were conducted at lower speeds because the customer mentioned needing a maximum speed of only 350 RPM. The following video we recorded after all three torture tests were completed. Um, it shows the user interface with the selected shaking patterns and their successful operation. Before I play the video, I'll just draw your attention to the user interface there. Uh, we see three yellow indicator LED lights, and each one of those represents 
a orbital faking pattern, the first one being linear, the second one being orbital, the third one being double orbital. We also see a red LED light and immediately under that a button. That is the emergency stop button. If anything were to fail during testing, we would simply press that button and all motion in the design is stopped. The three white dials on the left are the potentiometers that we use to control the speed, the radius, and the shaking pattern. Um, they can all be adjusted to determine which set of conditions we want to run. And the green LED in the top left simply lets us know that the system is ready to go. So let me play this video and we'll watch it work. All right, so this is demonstrating linear motion. We are then switching the dial to orbital motion. Note that we did not have to stop operation to shift from linear to orbital. It is still running. And then shifting again to double, double orbital also does not have to stop running. And that is operation of stake core. And here we are for our design highlights. Our very first key feature is our Core XY support frame. And our support frame is simple. It's easy to attach and it integrates seamlessly with the Core XY actuation system. It boasts a high structural integrity with a low transported weight and a small footprint. And our support frame is primarily fabricated out of aluminum. And it, this includes a, a custom base plate as well as modified aluminum tubing for supports, OTS steel guide rods and guide rod mounts, 3D printed components, and also rubber feet to keep the platform in place and dampen any noise or vibrations. Next screen, next slide. Our design features the wall support plate and the wall plate holder. The wall support plate is made from two thin sheets stacked on top of one another. In the original design, the wall support plate was made of aluminum. However, supply chain issues resulted in the pieces being fabricated from wood by one of our team members. The wood pieces are much lighter than the aluminum pieces while still providing the adequate strength. This ended up being beneficial for the shape core team as the lighter support pieces allowed the design to move much quicker and more accurately, giving it a better overall performance. Therefore, the wooden support plate that functions as a placeholder will change to high density polyethylene. Off-the-shelf parts allow shake core to reduce cost and manufacturing time, as well as facilitate maintenance throughout the shaker table's lifetime. The off-the-shelf wall plate holder that was initially going to be used into the design could not be acquired during the semester, leading the team to fabricate another wooden part to hold the wall plates. While this piece does a good job of holding the wall plate, it's simply functioning as a placeholder and will ultimately be changed to the off-the-shelf part, which would allow for future robotic manipulation and ODFI compatibility. Unmute your mic. We selected the common actuation method known as Core XY actuation. This design is based on the principle of a modern 3D printer, where essentially a carriage supported by guide rods and linearly actuating pillow blocks attaches to a carriage that can move independently in the X and Y coordinate axes. By routing a system of timing belts and two pulleys around the design, Two individually controllable stepper motors could be used to maneuver the carriage in any configuration in the XY coordinate plane. This design allows the motors to remain stationary, and because they are the largest source of inertia within the system, there is a lower probability of racking and the weight of the motors does not have to be transported. That meant that rapid acceleration was achievable as the motors provide a means of moving both axes independently or simultaneously. If you look to the figure on the right, rotating only either the left or the right motor would move the carriage diagonally away or towards the active motor. Rotating both motors in the same direction would move the carriage along the width of the frame and rotating the motors in opposite directions would move the carriage along the length of the frame. 
The two NEMA 17 stepper motors were selected after completing a torque and RPM analysis in which we can provide details on in the question segment of the presentation. They were the largest usable motors without stepping up to NEMA 23s that have relatively massive drivers. Some strengths of this design is that it could achieve extremely fast speeds with high accuracy and low vibration in comparison to other actuation methods, and thus it operates quite silently. Core XY actuation also allows for a balance of forces while moving the carriage, and so racking was further minimized. The X and Y position of each motor step was combined with the equations of motion for a core XY system, and it was then programmed to provide the desired linear orbital and double orbital patterns. And we achieved the ability to control the speed, radius, and shaking patterns independently. All right, so I'm going to take you through the evolution of the design from the initial concept on the left through to the preliminary CAD model and then to the manufactured prototype we have. Um, so for the initial concept, we decided to adapt the Core XY Cartesian motion platform. Um, many groups took the previous semester's designs, but we felt that those were inadequate in some ways. Most of those were either linkage-based designs that use let's say like a disc with an offset pin in order to uh, make harmonic linear motion um, or a lead screw design. Uh, we found that linkage-based designs required mechanical, physical adjustment of the radius um, and we couldn't do it on the fly. And lead screw-based designs are found to be slow and efficient as well as uh, very expensive to buy those long lead screws. Um, we decided on Core XY because its unique dual belt design allows for movement anywhere on the plane and is respons responsive enough to uh, meet and exceed by far the uh, customer needs for uh, RPM. Um, however, um, Core XY, as we said before, is primarily used for uh, 3D printers. So we need to adapt that uh, movement platform for the shaker table usage case. Uh, primarily meaning implementing um, harmonic or oscillatory motion, as well as tuning it to adjust for an ideal range of speed and radius for the customer. Um, another flaw that we found in the initial concept, as you see on the left, is there are a couple extraneous uh, rigid support rods. As you can see between the two motors and the motor mounts, um, those weren't needed because we have this on a fixed base plate, as you can see later. Um, and it also had no homing capability, which means like no limit switches to stop it from moving in one direction or not. Um, in our prototype CAD model, as you can see in the middle image, um, we replaced the bulky motor mounts and carriages from the left picture with much lighter hollow uh, tube stock that we uh, modified from off the shelf stock. Um, these were much more inexpensive, lighter and more compact than the initial concept. Uh, as a rule, we uh, replaced as many parts that could have been custom manufactured with more inexpensive off-the-shelf equivalents whenever possible. Uh, that can be seen in the guide rods that go along the length of the machine, as well as the carriages that slide along those rods. Um, we used larger motors, as we said before. Uh, larger, They're still NEMA 17, so they still fit the same a relatively compact um, spacing pattern, um, but they still deliver quite a large amount of torque. Um, you have to understand because of the, like if you have test tubes that are filled with 50 or more milliliters of water, that's quite a lot of mass that you have to generate a significant RPMs for. So we went with fairly powerful uh, NEMA 17 motors for that. Uh, we also added uh, four limit switches in the prototype CAD model. Uh, for boundary detection in all four directions, one on each side in X and Y, as well as uh, wide rubber feet for vibration dampening. Um, more improvements that we made in the current prototype was overall lightening the uh, amount of mass that has to be traveled. Um, we also reduced the number of limit switches from four to two. Uh, instead of doing boundary detection in all four directions, we just did homing 
in just two, just to limit the amount of electronics that had to be on it. Um, we also, as we discussed before, um, fabricated the wooden well plate holder on the top there uh, because of supply chain issues. We couldn't find the, uh, we couldn't have the OTS well plate holder delivered in time. Um, but as we'll talk about later, uh, these will be replaced eventually. And we have plans for that for um, replacing those with high density polyethylene and the OTS part there. Um, and it's also, as you can't really see it in the image, but in the center of the prototype image, you can kind of see where the belts clamp onto the bottom of the well plate holder. Uh, we have plans to replace that with an aluminum fab fabricated component as well. So this is the summary of the costs for both the single unit prototype production and a, a potential mass production run of our design. So as you can see for the raw materials, there's about a 50% reduction from $138.80 to $63.12, um, largely due to the economies of scale when we're ordering more material at once and then we're not, none of that is excess and it all goes towards each unit. Um, for OTS parts, there's also a large uh, cost reduction. When we scale up, uh, this is, a lot of that is due to when we were ordering parts for the prototype, we had to order, say, a pack of 100 screws when we didn't need that many. So the single prototype unit had to bear all of that cost. But once we move to mass production, we'll be able to distribute the cost of those OTS parts across all of the units. And then also, the price of things like the motors and the drivers also reduced as we started ordering a greater quantity. Then um, our greatest cost reduction between these two scenarios is the manufacturing cost. So to arrive at that $12,225 no, figure for the single unit cost, we took the um, manufacturing time that we were quoted by the class lab that was used to produce the parts that we ordered and multiplied that by a standard uh, machine shop rate to arrive at $1,200. And then for the mass production run, we took those same parts and uploaded them to an online uh, part quoting service called Zometry. And that was able to give us a $216 price for the parts needed for one unit. Um, and that was quoting a, a thousand unit production run. And then finally, for assembly, we don't have much of a difference between the way that we intend to assemble the two units. So we took the amount of time that it is expected to take someone to assemble some of the major electrical components like the, the UI interface and the um, just putting all the parts together into the model and multiplied that by a assembly workers rate to come at 1275 for both models. And that brought us to a total of $1,984.58 for the prototype and $684.74 for a single unit when it is mass produced. Now we're going to um, move on to give you a walk around of our CAD and uh, show you some of the features we'd like to improve. All right, so um, if you give me one second, I will share my screen. Um, just let me know that you can see the screen all right. Yep. All right. So this is the CAD model that we have. Um, I was, unfortunately, for the photos that we had in the presentation, uh, they don't show you pictures of the enclosure that we made. Um, we haven't physically fabricated it yet, but we have completely designed it. Um, and that would look like this, just to give it a much more aesthetic appearance and limit like pinch points for the customer's perspective. Um, like I said, we weren't able to fabricate this, but we have it all designed out like that. Um, as you can see, uh, there are two sets of guide rods, one in this axis, the primary axis here, as well as the secondary axis here. And this motor, this first motor uh, has a belt which allows it to go in a diagonal direction over to this, if that makes sense. 
um, along this axis. And the second motor causes diagonal uh, displacement along its diagonal. Um, the pulley system we have in place um, is directly from the core XY concept with a total of 10 pulleys, including the pulleys here attached to the bottom of the motors. Um, one adjustment that we made from the concept is having these motors on the carriage um, overlap just for simplicity. Um, another thing that uh, is not included yet that we weren't required to do was the ODFI implementation to shine light from the bottom here through up through either well plates or test tubes. Um, but that will be implemented eventually by a future semester. Um, I have a exploded view that should more easily explain how things are assembled together here. As you can see, these top screws here hold the entire um, moving carriage in place, uh, which makes assembly much easier. And these side um, carriages are basically mirrored also to aid in the ease of assembly. Um, some improvements that we plan on making in future semesters, um, apart from physically manufacturing the enclosure, um, we encountered a slight amount of tilt on these connecting rods here due to uh, a tolerance issue between that rod and this angle bracket. Uh, in, in a future semester, we plan on um, decreasing the tolerance so it's a tighter fit to allow for less tilt and leeway when these pulleys are under tension. Um, additionally, these screws here are low profile screws in order to make the screws flush with this ODFI plate. Um, depending on the dimensions of that ODFI system, this might not be necessary and we can go with much cheaper or more inexpensive um, off the shelf screws that don't have that ultra low profile for the head. Um, other improvements that we plan on making in future semesters uh, include sourcing appropriate spacers, uh, both for the well plate holder, as well as the pulley rods here. Uh, unfortunately, because we weren't able to source some spacers for this, we had to use washers, which uh, definitely increases the assembly time. Um, as as well as some more electrical changes and software changes. Um, if you have any questions, please let us know and we'll address those as you see fit. Okay, awesome. Um, <clears throat> so we can um, open up the, the discussion and the questions. Um, Michelle is our industry panelist. Uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but if you've got questions, you you could be up first. Um, how much time do we have left? I guess I'll prioritize my questions depending on that. Um, well, so we we started a little bit late because of both both me and then the the um, computer glitch in the beginning. So I think we could probably run about twenty more minutes uh, if if you guys are okay to stick around that long. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, I yep. don't think my questions will take 20 minutes, but I, I guess my first question for the CAD would be about the pulley system and like, how are you securing that in place? Like, seems like that's a very vulnerable aspect of your design. Like if that fails, then your whole design might, you know, like if it slips or something. So have you considered? Um, do you mean the pulley slipping like vertically? Or do you mean like a horizontal tilt? Um, either or, right? Like any failure related to the pulley system. How are you, what what design considerations have you taken into account to avoid that? Um, the material choice that we made, both for these connecting rods and for the um, angle bracket here, 
as well as the uh, fitment for these pulleys. Um, we investigated that um, and we looked at the like the fatigue cycle for it and okay. it seems like it's very resilient for like fatigue stress okay as and far as vertical motion um, we actually left those pulleys free floating so that they would self-align so what we mean by that is there is a little bit of height difference between the drive pulley to the pulley that Austin is pointing at right there over to the corner pulleys and by allowing them to move vertically up and down on that shaft they're able to all line up on the exact same plane so we don't have any kind of strain in the belt or any unnecessary the, strain the is our being pulled in different directions and that's the big issue with when customers all and your assembly time was what for the whole system so just putting together like all the parts ready to go we found um it was around 15 minutes um but we increased we added in like um the uh soldering time for the electrical interface mm -hmm. if we were to include that it came around out to around 51 minutes that was just based off of how we did it but if we were to have a professional do it that might be faster i'm just reflecting back to uh how much trouble we had in our design with assembly because it had to do with you know something very similar to like tolerances and everything and like this pulley kind of remind like brings back those memories of like i think your assembly time might might be underestimated but again um that's just something i'm thinking of dr trom i don't know if it's not a big, um, big factor. Um, yeah, um, it, it likely did take us a little bit longer than that uh, to do it in real life, but we uh, used the um, tables that Dr. Trauma had provided for the manual assembly times. And so that's, extremely. we tried to like uh, standardize that time based off of somebody like doing it in a professional setting with a, uh, like a worker who was experienced at doing it and would, know the proper steps to take mm -hmm. as long as your design accommodates for that right and i guess my final question would then be like what if you were to redo all of this again what would you do differently and anybody can answer that what, what, what question what can engineering so. provide what can engineering provide so so what i would say is well one thing i would like to do differently was um I was kind of hoping that we would be able to get the footprint even smaller. And I think that maybe if we had gone with a different option other than those um, like stock brackets in the corners, maybe if we had found a different size of stock or a different shape of stock, we might have been able to bring that footprint in tighter. But um, yeah, that wasn't that was something that I thought that we might be able to look into. Overall, I'm uh, pretty happy with our design and how it came out. I was very impressed with the performance that we were able to get out of it and really a lack of issues in testing, which was very surprising to me. But um, to second Spencer, I definitely think that our footprint could be a little bit smaller on the design. Um, also, just finding a way to standardize our fasteners and see if we could use more of the same fasteners. I think there are four or five or six different unique fastener types in here, which require you to change to different um, Allen wrenches and screwdrivers and things to put it together. Um, simplifying that would be great, as well as being able to fully manufacture the wooden pieces that we have there to be made from HDPE as we had initially intended. Um, and the other thing that would have been really great for us would be to make the electronics box a little bit bigger. That would allow us to not have to put the stepper drivers and um, all of that wiring on such a small perf board. Um, from very much personal experience on that, that perf board was very difficult to manufacture because of how small it had to be. But other than that, um, 
pretty happy with the design overall. Yeah, I was um, very impressed with how the physical aspects of the design came along. But um, one thing that I wish I would have done more research on uh, before I did it was the the software for like programming these uh, stepper motors. Um, Arduino is great in a way, but it's also a very frustrating experience, uh, especially if you encounter like third party like stepper motor driver libraries and then they don't work the way that you want them to it can be very frustrating sadly arduino is also used in industry so you will have to kind of be with it <laughs> yeah can't wait Well, the great presentation, first of all, and then all of these lessons that you guys are reflecting on, kind of hold on to them because they're going to be very useful, you know, when you actually go out into the industry and work. And especially a point that you guys brought up about trade-offs, right? Everything is kind of a trade-off where you have to either give off, give up on performance or footprint. So um, big decisions, but, you know, um, you will learn. And then I hope you guys enjoyed this experience I'm of sure I'll be talking to senior design and whoever's graduating, congrats. On that too. Right, because then I'll, I'll also be Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, attending and asking those questions. We really appreciate it. Don't Thank you. make any efforts. Very good. Okay. Um, Alex, are you still here? Yes, you are. Do you want to? Yes, absolutely. Hello. Hello. Uh, so Hello. Do you want to jump in personally, and ask? Yes, absolutely. Uh, great presentation, guys. Thank you. Uh, really appreciate all the hard work that went into this. Um, I guess Dr. Trauma has been asking this question in the, the previous presentations, but I'm going to ask it here. Um, so you guys were one of the only two groups that did a core XY uh, for your shaker table. Uh, now, the, the question I'm about to ask is a genuine question. It's not a trick question, uh, I promise. Um, but do after, or I guess after going through the design process and more or more specifically the manufacturing and testing process and seeing the results of how this design works uh, in real life, uh, maybe aligning with or not aligning with what you predicted in your calculations and design, um, as a collective unit, do you believe after having made this prototype that the core XY system is the best solution for this problem or maybe after looking at some of the other designs uh, that may have been present throughout the lab space if there is a different design that you think is more suitable uh, to actually completing all the customer needs in a more controlled and uh, maybe a more reliable manner yeah um yes i do believe that the core xy is by far the preferable uh, motion system. Um, I talked about it a little bit in the presentation um, about how linkage designs have the flaw of you can't um, just change just via software the size of the radius. Um, I mean, in theory, you could do like an electromechanical way to adjust a linkage, but that would be way too complicated for like this budget and this form factor. Um, I believe the, the belt design is much easier to do that. Um, it gives the design in general a lot more plasticity in terms of the movement patterns that you can do. Um, because it is anywhere on the XY plane, it's completely independent. You don't have to have any particular uh, harmonic motion. And it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't even have to be harmonic at that point. I mean, because linkages are just stuck in whatever amplitude or wavelength that the distance of the linkage um, results in. Whereas with the belt fed design, this can go anywhere on this uh, platform as long as it doesn't run into uh, interference issues. And I, I believe that gives this design a lot more uh, merit. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, great question, Alex. Um, to add on to that, Based on the testing that I've seen personally of our design, I would say that it is 
one of the best ways to solve the problem. Um, something that I definitely am interested in myself and would be very interested in pursuing with more time would be how well this thing performs um, longevity wise. Like what happens when we set it on orbital and we let the thing run for a week? You know, how does that work? Does it, does it make it through the entire week? Do the belts wear out? Do we lose tension? Um, those are all questions that based on our experience right now, we can't answer um, and something that I would love to answer, but based on the knowledge that we have at the moment, I would say yes, for the reasons that Austin mentioned, um, it definitely, we feel like it is a very solid design. Okay, so so to, to follow up on that, um, I, th I think I'm right in saying, and I think I heard one of you guys say this, that um, nowhere in any of the designs that, that we handed you in the beginning of the semester was there a, a Core XY, um, like Mech 2 design from any of the, the, the previous classes. Is that right? Correct. Um, Not that we saw. Okay. To our knowledge, yes. So, so... Uh, so in a way, you, you guys are so so. Ha -ha. Doctor Nimi, who's not here, so I can say whatever I want. Doctor Nimi and I fight fight about this constantly because, um, like, to me, this is you know okay yes we try to simulate for you what it's like to be um i, I use the word when i wrote recommendation letters that capstone is like being in a beleaguered startup company those are the exact words that i use um so we try to simulate for you what it's what it's like to to kind of be in that that startup you know company type environment um but there's there's a, a safety net right which is um if you come up with a design and it doesn't work for whatever reason, you're, you're not like homeless out on the street, right? You don't like lose your job and your company goes out of business. This is, um, you know, kind of a, an opportunity in my mind um, to, to, you know, to use the catchphrase you know, to go big or go home. And um, you know, th th this is a, a, a good group. I've had you guys, most of you in Mech 2, um, and you guys are all, are, you know, high-performing students. But tell me about that that moment, right? You guys go through the house of quality, and <laughs> you, you say to yourself, okay, um, you know, a, a ton of really smart people, you know, Alex being one of them, um, you know, basically tried to solve this problem before, and nobody came up with this core XY thing. And we're going to just, like, basically reject 25 other possible shaker table microbioreactor designs. And we're going to go off in this direction that nobody else came up with um, and, and like pursue that for our, for our mech three project. Um, how did that feel? Like, like did every, was everybody on board? Was everybody like, yeah, let's do this thing. And even if it crashes and burns, it's fine. Or was there some, fear hesitation a, a group of of you know dissenters in the minority who are like this is crazy guys why are we doing this or once you guys saw this core xy thing like you were done i yeah, i think we all saw the merit to core xy and like i kind of explained earlier like the the benefits of it um i can't really speak in terms of like dissension but when you introduced house of quality in your lecture you talked about like trying to sell your own pen right mm -hmm. like what does this pen do that other existing um, things that are already on the market don't do as like basically a gauge whether to say whether i should invest in trying to manufacture this and produce it um and i think with our decision to adopt the, the core xy movement system it was kind of that sort of like realization like oh we do actually have a market for this thing and we do have an opportunity to produce a product that is superior in many ways to um, existing designs i feel like that's kind of the, the essence of like startup creation right is trying to go out there and do something better than the existing market does that make sense to you? 
Yeah, yeah, no, I mean this, this to me, this like I said, Doctor Nimi and I fight about this endlessly because I think his his philosophy is very different. His philosophy is, um, and he's not here, so I can say whatever I want. Uh, choose something that's safe that you know is going to work, right? I mean, I, I feel like a lot of times he pushes students in that direction, uh, whereas I'm I'm the like, you know, there's you could fail all you want and. There's, you know, we have a safety net, which is you're not going to be homeless at the end. Um, so I feel like, in a way, this um, design um, is much more in line with with what I hope that most students would do in Capstone, right? It's and and I, I appreciate the, the the comment about house of quality and the pen and everything like that because interestingly, the real point of house of quality um is to basically look at what's out there on the market and select the the best solution that already exists and then just try to incre incrementally improve on that a little bit but you guys took it like in a totally different direction right you looked at the market and you're like basically everything out here is crap and we've got a better idea and we're, we're going to run with it so so i i I appreciate that you guys did that. Like to me, this is this is an incredible success story for the way that I think capstone should be should be taught. Um, and, and to be fair, not not every group has got you know the, the chops that you guys have. Uh, we've seen a couple of other groups that you know kind of tried to go big and ended up basically crashing and burning. Um, so like you know, it's, it's, I'm I'm happy and thankful that this this worked out as successfully as it did. Um, we've got three minutes left. So I have, I have one more, one more question, which is um, more about intellectual property. So um, you guys are, if, if I understand correctly, I had to look up what a core XY 3d printer was, but um, you guys are basically borrowing that design. It would be like the XY stage of, of that 3d printer um, for the shaker table. And I, and I think I'm right in saying that that's in the public domain. Yes, it is. Right. So, so as in you guys aren't stealing somebody's patent by incorporating this into a shaker table. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So, so that being said, what prevents somebody else, some other company from saying, this is awesome. We're going to copy it and we're going to, you know, buy our parts from, um, uh, oh gosh, what's that website that I hate that I guess. That, well, I, I hate them too, but that's for a different reason. Alibaba. Um, yeah, there you go. Alibaba. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I try to like block it out. I remember. Yeah. Oh my God. So yeah, we're gonna we're gonna buy our parts from Alibaba and we're gonna undercut these guys, right? So what what given that like the core technology that differentiates you from all the other shaker tables is already in the public domain, how do you turn this into a company? Um besides um, a lot of money spent on patent lawyers. Um, <laughs> well, that won't help you, right? Because it's the the core XY technology is already in the public domain, so it cannot be patented. Right. Um, there are many ways that we looked at um, in like the milestone one, milestone two um, timeline, where like how can we make this design like even better, and one of the things that we looked at was uh, potentially iterating this where it's not just one well plate it's just basically the same design copy and pasted and as our like future improvements one of the things that we looked at was reducing the footprint as much as possible and so we could have these um, sort of modular designs where you could have multiple of these right next to each other um, theoretically running off the same motors because it's all belt fed right so you could have just like two or three of these in your micro bioreactor concept like right next to each other or potentially on top of one another because like the customer needs also has the 3d axis movement for uh positioning the well plates and things like that so i think that could be explored as well in like future semesters and that would make it much more uh, unique and less likely to be stolen as intellectual property so the idea then is to it, you're ooh, okay you've got this core xy kind of foundational thing and if i'm hearing right the, the 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 game plan if you were to commercialize is to come up with an additional novel feature that is itself patentable 
that's beyond the core X Y stage, and that's that's how you you protect yourself. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Which that, that's not. I mean, there, in business, there's no there's no right or wrong answer. So um, that's uh, interestingly, you guys are in a very similar situation to when I ran my lab kit company, it was the same story. Um, a lot of the, in fact, all the technology that I was using was basically in the public domain on purpose because it was available and inexpensive. Um, and ultimately when I started talking to patent lawyers, it was, we have to invent some new widget that's basically foundational to the operation of your lab kits. Um, that we can patent. And then that's what will keep your lab kits protected from, you know, infringement. Um, and then when I looked at other competing companies, the company, you guys probably know Pasco, right? You probably were in a physics lab in high school at some point and played with Pasco. They, they've got those cars on the rails that you bump into each other for mm -hmm. momentum and energy conservation experiments. They're all over the place in high schools and uh, lower division physics labs. Um, that's precisely how Pasco protects their intellectual property is they've got this like box, right? And you and you take the the Pasco car rail thing, which is definitely not patentable, and you plug it into this Pasco box, and then the Pasco box plugs into a computer, and the Pasco box is the patented element of the overall technology, and the Pasco system doesn't work without the box, um, but that's what Pasco ultimately patented was the box, not like the actual rails or anything. So, so it is, and Pasco is a very successful ed tech company. So, so that's, that's a, a viable possibility. So um, yeah, that's, that's a bit of a, of a, of a pickle though, because you guys um, you've got this, this cool, novel, innovative thing, um, but it's already out in the public domain. Now you're using it in a different, so I wonder if you could, oh gosh, I wonder if you could, attempt to patent it because it's a different application than like, so, so originally it was meant for um, like 3d printers. And, and I wonder if you could maybe patent it like in the realm of shaker tables, like if you could change the the claims so that it's far enough differentiated from what's in the public domain that it's patentable. Uh, that was one of our thoughts as well. Yeah. That yeah. since it's a novel application. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that might even be worth, you know, a, a chat with Rick Crowley. Um, I don't know if you guys remember Rick Crowley from MacDo. Um, he's the the tech licensing guy that that um, basically oversees engineering projects. But um, it, it might be worth having a, having a chat with him because I, I think this is cool enough that that it. it it might be worth at least a you know a fifteen minute phone call just with Rick just to see if if given that you're taking something that exists in the public domain and using it for something that it was never originally thought of or meant to be used for, if there's a way to to actually get um, some sort of IP protection for it. So anyway, just a kind of a, a side thought. It's it's. Mm -hmm. um, I ahead. agree, Dr. Trom. I think it is very much possible and it happens all the time in industry where you make a very slight tweak or you change the application where it's being used. And if you have a good lawyer, you you probably might just go through. So it happens all the time. And I would say that if you have the opportunity, go for it. Don't miss out on it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. especially while well, you guys are still UF students and you have access yeah. to Rick Crowley and all the, the licensing office resources. It, it might be worth a phone call anyway, just to just to check to see. My My, my instinct is that it's probably not patentable but you know I, i'm not a lawyer so it's worth it's worth checking with rick to see if it is um okay well so as usual i'm way over time i'm even over time given that i started over time so um probably a, a good place to to stop there um i guess just my kind of final parting comment is is you guys have survived uh what some of my colleagues in the faculty describe as the uh, the final boss of the mechanical engineering curriculum. Um, so, so congratulations on making your way through the entire capstone sequence and getting to the end of Mech three and emerging with with a, a very impressive and workable and viable design. Um, just like we did last semester, we're going to inject this and all of the other designs from this semester into 
the next semester and let those guys do the house of quality down selection and then pick the designs that they want to move forward with for um, uh, ODFI optical density and fluorescent intensity integration. Uh, and then also we, we'd originally this semester planned to do um, testing in, in very cold and very hot environments um, consistent with like the inside of the, of the microbioreactor. And we, we have the, the testing capabilities to do that, but we sort of ran out of time. So um that's that's where this will go next semester is this will end up getting uh you know sort of hardened for those environments and tested uh stress tested in, in hot and cold environments for longer periods of time so um, i'm very hopeful that that next semester students see the potential in this one that i think we as the panel saw um and, and it ends up uh you know moving forward to possible commercialization um so, so hence one more time, my, my thought about, um, you know, before you guys graduate, maybe just giving Rick Crowley a call, because if there is something patentable here, you want to make sure that that's like identified and covered and protected before this gets injected into the next, the next cycle of mech three. Uh, because at that point, as soon as it enters like house of quality analysis and spring 2023 mech three, you sort of lose your ability to, to, patent it uh, because it'll then be you know essentially in the public domain so um anyway okay that's my final thought so so thanks for a great semester and all of your your hard work and energy and reaching this sex, se <laughs> successful conclusion um let me hit the record button to stop recording